All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for SME's Technical Community and Aerodef Manufacturing Satellite Session. We are thrilled that you were able to make time to attend the Industry 4.0 for Aerospace Manufacturing in 2020 Impact Challenges and Best Practices webinar. We will go ahead and get started in just a minute, but I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. First, please make sure that you submit any questions to our panel using the Q&A box. Our moderator will keep an eye on all of the Q&A throughout the event. And please note that your microphones are automatically muted. So if you have questions or comments to make, please use the chat feature inside the webinar. We will be monitoring this um, and will respond accordingly. So secondly, we will be having a couple of polls throughout the webinar, so keep an eye out. We want you to um, make sure you're able to participate and we want your feedback. Third, as you heard, we will be recording this presentation and it will be available on demand. So finally, you're in for a treat. Sit back and enjoy. Today's webinar on Industry 4.0 for Aerospace Manufacturing in 2020 is going to be moderated by Avner ben Bassat, President and CEO of Platane, which is a leading provider of industrial IoT and AI-based optimization solutions for complex manufacturing environments. So Avner, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Get started uh, soon here, and uh, and with a few rounds of introduction, we have a packed agenda, so we'll get going uh, right away. So first, let me uh, introduce our um, speakers for today. Um, we have from Lockheed, uh, Dr. Don Kinnard, um, Senior Fellow. From Spirit, uh, Kurt Richardson, also Technical Fellow. Uh, Shahar Fine, from an, uh, the Executive Vice President from Confit, a Tier 2 supplier out of Israel. Uh, Dr. Bob Yancey, uh, Director of Business Development for Hexel. And myself, I'm the President of Platane, uh, again, software company specializing in AI applications for manufacturing. The goals of the uh, of our panel today, uh, we'd like, first of all, to explore uh, what Industry 4.0 means for all of us, and we have here, you know, members of the entire supply chain. Um, what is this technology being applied to? How does it impact us? We'll discuss the problems that are already being addressed with these new capabilities. Uh, a few years ago, it was more ideas and visions. Today, it's reality. So what kind of outcomes are achieved? What are challenges are we seeing? Best practices, lessons learned. And, you know, finally, uh, cannot overlook, you know, COVID and the impact. So we'll discuss also what does it mean and how does it impact the adoption of these new technologies? We'll start with a few opening comments uh, from the panelists. Uh, we'll enter a panel discussion. Uh, towards the end, we'll have time for your questions. As Tracy mentioned, you can type them into the Q&A box on the right, and I'll pick them up and uh, address them with the panel's team. And then we'll wrap up with a few closing remarks. Before we get started and to set the stage, I wanted to share some key insights from a recent survey we completed with SME, Tracy, and the team behind her. Now, this is a survey we completed in 2020. Uh, and it's actually the second survey we do. The first one was in 2018. The participants actually were across a range of industries, albeit 30% came from aerospace and defense. And you see also a range of roles and, and levels in the organization. Among other things, uh, we looked into the level of digitization. And here we see a huge, huge step forward uh, compared to two years ago. When we ask how far our given company uh, progressed towards implementing digital manufacturing, you see this uh, massive surge of implementation, the massive drop of lack of interest. So this is happening, and it has happened in quite a dramatic fashion in the last two years. 
Then we also asked, how far did you go with this uh, so far? So here we see a lot of opportunity. Certainly we see a reduction in the paper intensive operations. We see more companies that have moved and became mostly digital. But on the other hand, a minority is fully digital. So certainly the movement has started, yet there is a long ways to go, and we'll talk about that today as well. Then we looked at why. Why are companies doing this? Not necessarily because it's uh, you know cool or for the sake of technology. And it really comes back to the usual um, business KPIs. Are we looking at lower production costs, on-time delivery, improved quality and capacity and so forth? We will say this from other research, we see a growing emphasis on digitization and, and cost reduction in the last couple of months, but across the board, we are looking both at top line and bottom line KPIs. This is what's driving industry into uh, industry 4.0. And finally, it's never that simple. So what are the challenges? And you see at the top, you see, first of all, lack of human resources, uh, people that are able to support this technology and push it through, uh, potential complexity of the system integration, a lot of siloed system, then there's a question of budget, or rather, how do you build one for such a project? And the list goes down. I won't go through the entire list. I'll just say that uh, this survey is available both on the SME website and our own platanes. And certainly, you can reach out to, to us, to Tracy, um, after the seminar, and we'll get you the full, uh, the full report. So with that, let me turn back to our panelists. Um, and again, uh, for each of you, if you can spend a couple of minutes on what Industry 4.0 means for you, uh, to your organization, where this is going from your perspective. And Don, if you can take uh, the first one, I'll appreciate it. Sure, thanks, Abner. Uh, you know, Lockheed Martin looks at Industry 4.0 as the, the fourth industrial Revolution. We look at it as the revolution of data, that we're trying to integrate data from floor systems, from uh, the, our ERP, PLM, MES systems, and to basically figure out how we take all of that data in all of our systems and use it. And we've, we've been on the route to digital transformation and Industry 4.0 for about 20 years. It started with the digital thread on the F-35 program, the, the use of solid models, the consumption of those models, in manufacturing and planning, the use of it, you know, for autom driving automation, for driving inspection technology. So the first part of it was really digital transformation or digital thread. And then we started hooking up all of our equipment to the intranet. So, you know, you start going through the IoT plan and now all, a lot of our equipment's getting hooked up. And then finally, you look at the amount of information you have in the PLM, MRP and ERP systems and you realize that there's that data that can be integrated in the same systems that can be that can talk to one another and so instead of having data being very siloed the data can be integrated and available across all of the enterprise so i think to me digital or industry 4.0 is really the the enterprise view of the way we do business and how we get everything together. And that's kind of our, our journey that we've been on for a long time. It's just gonna continue going forward. Thank you, Don. Um, Shahar, coming from your perspective as a supplier to the industry? Well, as a supplier to the industry, uh, the digi digitalization is, is a must because all the large OEMs are going there. So on the other, so on one hand, we have no choice but going after them. And on the other hand, we want to run before them so uh, we, can, uh, we can be competitive and uh, be able to offer them better solutions. And one of the challenges that we face with the digitalization is that each OEM has his own system. And as a supplier, we need a system that can deal with all of them. Uh, and that's that's one of the biggest challenges that we face. We need to interface with a lot of systems. Okay, thank you, Shahal. Um, Bob, how about yourself? Yeah, so <clears throat> Bob Yancey, I'm with Hexel. Hexel is a material 
primarily a materials provider. So we provide, you know, carbon fiber, carbon fiber prepregs and fabrics, honeycomb core. Uh, we do some additive manufacturing. We also do some aerostructures uh, work, uh, both engineered core and, and uh, composite aerostructures. So, you know, our perspective on Industry 4.0, it is creating that digital thread, but the digital thread is starts from the raw material and goes through to the finished goods that we supply our customers. And, and we are looking at Industry 4.0 really to improve our operational efficiency, uh, to uh, improve our quality and our responsiveness to our customers. And uh, so we have implemented a number of projects in order to be able to increase those metrics, uh, which in the end lead to the bottom line of our company and benefit our shareholders. Thank you, Bob. Super. And Kurt, last but not least, how does it look from Spirit's point of view? Yeah, thanks. Um, so for, for Spirit, we're a tier one supplier to the, to the aerospace community. Um, and so we work with lots of diff different customers. And as you might imagine, we have a lot of different systems that we interface with. Um, and so we're looking at Industry 4.0 as pretty simply um, leveraging the data that we're already generating to be able to make smarter decisions. Um, and typically now doing it with digital tools and processes. Um, we, use, we use an analogy to talk about it. We call it accelerating the learning curve. So if you're familiar with that, that context, um, our goal is to enter into new production at T100 or line unit 100 type efficiency, uh, performance and cost, and eliminate that upfront waste that you would normally see when you kick off a production run. Um, also using it, that, that data, that information to be able to steepen the slope of the learning curve and drive to those optimal levels of performance more quickly, reduce variation along that curve, uh, kind of smooth it out. So we, we think that's an analogy that makes sense. Um, we have a couple of different, well, several different various elements uh, that, that we're deploying, but really I think they can all be summed up for us in terms of data transformation. Um, I know we talk about digital transformation a lot, but we, we start even maybe one step before that. Um, if we look at connecting systems and collecting data, we're transforming that raw data by analysis so that we can create information. And when we add some context to that information, we're generating knowledge. And then if we take that knowledge and use it as an input to the system, then we, we essentially create a closed loop control state. And that's what we're trying to get to, where we're using the information to influence how we do business for the better. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, guys, thank you very much. Uh, Tracy, let's start with the first polling question. Uh, for those of you participating in the panel, you'll see it on your right. There's a set of icons. One of them has this kind of a chart icon with the word polls. And you'll see the first polling question. We'd really like to get your feedback here. Um, how does Industry 4.0 impact your organizations, and did they exceed your expectations, meet your expectations, or, or really fell short of these expectations? So if you can help us here, um, submit your, um, your vote, your input. We'll share the results, and we'll take the discussion from there. So it's on your right. We'll take about a minute. Thank you. By the way, we have almost 150 participants today, which is wonderful, speaking of digitization. So we'll actually have a very good sample here. And I'm going to close the poll in just one second, so make sure you put your answer. Okay, so Tracy, thanks a lot. Let's wrap it up here. And again, you can all see the results. I'll, I'll read them out. Um, so we see kind of a majority, uh, around 45% to 50, it's kind of jumping around, uh, say it met their expectation. 
There's an almost similar number, 42%, that did not meet their expectation. We'll talk about that. And a minority actually uh, experienced uh, it to exceed their expectation. So, you know, perhaps we'll start with this question. Um, Kurt, if you'd like to comment on that, you know, what kind of expectations do people go into with these projects? What have you seen at Spirit? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say the, the results of the poll are, are about what I would expect to see. Um, I, I'm glad to see that so many folks are, have projects that have met expectations. Um, that's good, and that probably means that the scope was defined up front, the, the expected result and benefit was defined up front, um, and, and that's what we've seen here is when those elements of the plan and the technology insertion are clear and communicated up front, um, it, it leads to better results overall. Um, as far as not meeting expectations, um, really kind of the opposite side of that coin. So if you're not clear really from the beginning of what you're trying to achieve and uh, the costs of what you're trying to do, um, you can be disappointed in the end. So, and, and we've, we've had both experiences here, frankly, um, and, and hopefully we're on the, the, the up side of that now. But yeah, we, we've had both, definitely. Okay, Don, would you like to chime in here? From uh, my point of view, I guess I agree with what Curtis was saying. I kind of, what I expected. I think I personally have such high expectations that I'm constantly disappointed, you know, when things aren't as good as I want them to be. So, you know, my boss says that, you know, nothing good was ever done by reasonable people. So I'm, I'm not a reasonable person. I'm unreasonable. I have high expectations. And so I'm constantly disappointed. But, I mean, the technology is, uh, I mean, you can, it, it's so close to being something that's so tangible that you can you can feel it. And so I'm I you know I'm a does not meet expectations because my expectations are are probably grandiose. But again, that's just me. Okay, uh, allow me to chime in here and, and echo Kurt's comment. We see a lot of this. Uh, you know, if you go into a project, you know you need to understand what you're trying to do, and and look at it like any technology adoption set your expectations in a realistic way, and then plan to achieve them. Nothing's different here. This, is, this has been our experience. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, let's let me, forward. Governor, let me can I comment on this? Um, so I voted sure. on this, and I actually I'm one of the exceed expectations. So, you know, we've, um, we put very, uh, we put financial metrics on all of these projects, have been tracking it regularly the last three years. And, um, and have actually been exceeding um, the return on investment for these projects. Doesn't mean that every project has been successful um, and we've tried to implement procedures that if it's not going as well, we stop that project and move on to something else. But it's actually been quite refreshing to the whole organization to see how much improvement we're being able to make in our um, materials manufacturing operation through using digitalization and, and these industry 4.0 tools. Great. I think, um, that one, I think that one of the most important things when you set the expectations is to explain to the teams that are dealing with such a technology is that what the technology is going to do is it's going to help them make a better use of their time. So. It's not going to solve their problems for them. It's going to help them solve the problems by clearing all the problems that were not the core issue. Data is no longer an obstacle. Data is now turning into a tool. When they realize that, their expectations move in the right direction. They expect the system to help them. And, and when it happens, it, it exceeds their expectations. Okay, so thank you, Shahar. Actually, it's a great um, lead into into the next topic I'd like to cover. Uh, you know, what if you could talk about some project or initiative to the extent you can share the data and some of the lessons learned, perhaps, Shahar, you, you started to talk about the engagement of the team, but uh, please go first. You know, what was been a, what has been a successful initiative and what made it successful? And 
we have uh, implemented uh, in our production line, we've implemented a system uh, that is using Bluetooth chips uh, to track parts around the, the shop flow. Um, people were very doubtful that uh, it could help us. Um, and we did, we did the beta. So we took 100 chips. Um, we attached them to uh, various wall coders. And we let the system run and, and see what kind of feedback uh, does the system uh, generate. Everybody were really surprised to see that on those first 100, the system by itself managed to locate two walk orders that went uh, in the wrong walk station. And the system uh, gave uh, a warnings to the to the relevant uh, department managers that their parts that they were looking for were actually in a different place. Um, and and that, that really generated some buzz around the factory because uh, parts being misplaced is a huge headache, especially when they're small and can get lost very easily. Um, the, the AI behind the system uh, was, was really incredible that even on the first part, it could learn it by itself. Now people are expecting that there will be no more lost parts uh, in production. Thank you, Shachal. Bob, do you want to go? Yeah. <clears throat> so one, it's not a very glamorous uh, case study, but it definitely had value to us. So we make carbon fiber, and so the carbon fiber goes on to tools which go onto a creel. And so we wanted to be able to capture information in terms of which pool the carbon fiber was going onto so that we could gain some insight into that. So initially um, we had an operator who would, you know, type in the computer, you know, this carbon this carbon fiber line is going onto this spool, which is positioned on the creel in this way. And it turned out to be it was it was inefficient for the operator. Um, it created a safety problem because they're looking back and forth between the computer and the uh, creel and so forth. So we just bought barcode sc scanners that, and put barcodes on the creel. And so they can just go through boom, 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 boom. And uh, so now we know the location uh, on the creel and uh, what school it's on and uh, have actually been able to gain some interesting insights that have improved the efficiency of the overall operation. Okay, thanks, Bob. Please, Don, go ahead, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, just one of the most exciting things that I've seen in a business for a long time uh, is really some advanced metrology applications, laser scanning, structured light scanning, and, you know, when I think about IoT, I think about connecting engineering to the floor. Well, you know, with structured light scanning and uh, uh, laser scanning, I can actually compare my as-built configuration to my as-design configuration in real time, essentially. And I'll give you just one application. Uh, you know, we, uh, we came up with this uh, laser scanner that instead of putting a big tool in the weapons bay to check for clearances, we put a laser scanner there and physically measure the bay with the laser scanner, compare that to the model that we used to put in there. It's a whole lot faster, a whole lot more accurate. And that's just one of many, many applications for, you know, for that, for that technology to, to really compare the as built to the as designed. And eventually that'll be done in real time. So you're essentially inspecting as you go along. So those things, it's that kind of thing that's just, it's so exciting to see, and you know, it's becoming very routine for us. But again, there's so much more to go, and we have one of our fellows, Chris Barrow at, at Lockheed, that's really working real hard to bring that technology to the floor. But that's probably one of the most exciting things I've seen in my my career with uh, digitization. Amazing. Thanks, Don and Kurt. What about you guys? What are the focus areas? Um. So really, kind of like Robert, we have something that, that was fairly basic, but it, it really made a big impact, um, and I, I would call it, it has to do with digital twinning. Um, we do quite a bit of composite structure 
uh, fabrication, and along with that goes non-destructive inspection requirements. Um, that process uh, is really surprisingly analog. There are some digital tools, but the interpretation of the data um, is an analog process largely, um, and there's not very much or hadn't been very much available for trending analysis. Um, and in fact, some of it was just plain hard to interpret um, because it's a lot of coordinate values and things like that. So we implemented a new system uh, that allows us to draw in in an automated fashion the inspection data and actually maps it onto a three-dimensional model in a CAD environment. And so the inspectors can see that data overlaid on the actual CAD model. So it's a, it's truly a digital twin of that particular line unit. And then over line units of history, you can go back and look at trending of where inequality discrepancies have happened. Um, and we've used it quite a few times for our CCA activity, and it's been very, very helpful for us. Okay, great. Actually, guys, you know, my takeaway here, first of all, this is relevant wherever you are on the supply chain. And second, some projects are more manufacturing oriented. Some focus on the uh, feedback loops back to engineering, digital twinning and all. And again, I, to the audience here, I would also point out that, you know, the sometimes simply digitizing a process takes you a long way. But I think the big value comes when you start putting the data to use. So we'll cover that more later on. Uh, so now look at the other side of, of this, uh, of this uh, technology. You know, what are the challenges that you guys have seen or, or risks in this implementation? Um, Kurt, if you want to go first this time around. Yeah, sure. A um, couple of big things, big ticket items. Uh, data architecture, data integrity is huge. Um, we have lots of sources of data. We don't always trust the data. Um, and there are legitimate issues around if you put bad data into a decision process, you're going to get a bad decision out. Um, and if people start to uh, distrust that that data source, it's almost a lost cause at that point. Um, so data integrity. Um, the, the architecture and the infrastructure required for digital data, and depending on how you're planning to use those data streams, that's that's a big deal. Um, and it can be it can be costly to ramp that up, uh, all of that infrastructure. Um, and then I'd say maybe the last one, the last big ticket item for us uh, would be skills, being able to find people with the right skills at all levels um, to support all the way from implementation of these types of systems in the manufacturing world to the analysts and, and analytic engineers and computer scientists uh, to do the analysis, whether it's in an office area or right there on the shop floor. Those, those folks can be difficult to, to find and, and to maintain. So, Kurt, allow me a quick follow-up here. So it mm -hmm. looks like you'd have a lot of people from a lot of different departments. Yeah. This 4.0 project. So who do you bring to the table? Yeah, good question. Um, it, it, as you can imagine, it kind of depends on the project. Um, but we definitely have the IT involved, um, and we have uh, quality is typically uh, right there with us manufacturing, engineering, um, and then depending on if, if there's an influencer element of design and materials and process engineering. So the, those, are, those are typically the, the core key players, and then we bring in others as needed. Okay. Bob, for you guys, perhaps a different world. So what are the big challenges that you see? Yeah, I mean, so I would say from a Macro level, I think the challenges are consistent across anybody trying to implement these technologies is that, you know, you can overspend on the project, you can overscope the project, you can deliver the project late. So we monitor those, you know, routinely to make sure that we're, we're not, you know, in a bad situation with any of those metrics. I think one of the challenges, I, in the last 20 years of my career I spent in the software industry, and I saw firsthand that one of the challenges in implementing new software tools is not getting buy-in through the organization, right? It might be something that's driven from the top down and, and uh, you know, the people lower down in the organization don't see the value in it and don't implement it and so forth. But one of the things that we've done at Hexcel is that often the opportunities for success 
the ideas come from the people in operations on the shop floor doing that because they clearly understand the bottlenecks and, and the issues. So we've got a process of really involving them and having the ideas bubble up from the bottom uh, and then look at it um, you know, from the top to determine which ones have the best return on investment. And those are the projects that we scope uh, to, to produce now. Got it, thank you. Shaho, please, thank you. I think one, <clears throat> one of the largest challenges is, is the production people. Uh, is there uh, the ones that we constantly measure uh, using the data <clears throat> that we gather they must see, uh, the, there are two things that you must make sure. One is that when you implement the system, it doesn't, it causes uh, interference with the work, it doesn't make their life harder, uh, and that they see the, uh, the direct uh, result of, of implementing that technology. Um, if, if the results are too far away and, you know, they, they just, implementing and implementing and they don't see a result, uh, they, will, they will end up uh, losing their faith in the system. So, so you must make sure it's, it's something easy. I recommend every, every, every industry 4.0 company to make their uh, user uh, interface as friendly as possible. Because once, once a production employee starts to lose their hands and legs in those technologies, um, you, you've failed already. Okay, thanks, Shahal. Don, thank you. Don, I'm sorry, you're on mute. There we go, sorry. Uh, I think the challenges uh, from the past have been the fact that, you know, we're a, we're a company made up of thousands and thousands of engineers all who have different ideas about what they think they want to do to make things better. So we constantly were fighting for funding to do this or that. And, and so uh, a couple of years ago, we established a digital transformation organization, uh, both at the corporate headquarters as well as at uh, uh, each of the business areas like Arrow where I am. So now we have a corporate organization and a local uh, or a BA organization that's really trying to focus efforts on digital transformation, digitization, industry 4.0. And I think now we, we get a much more direct uh, feed into what we need to do to, to address things for the future. So I think that's been a, a great help. Okay, so Don, and for you guys, there's actually a corporate leader that, uh, that runs uh, their own projects across the different divisions? Yes, well, we have, you know, again, the corporate organization who runs projects across the enterprise, and then we have local organizations that run projects across aeronautics. So both of those are connected. They We meet all the time. And it's really the only way to get uh, stuff together because some things are done as an enterprise. If you're going to put in a, oh, a new SAP system or something large, then you kind of do that as, a, as an enterprise. If you do something that's specific to you know, F-35, F-16, C-130, it's more at the local level. So it's both things working together, but with the same aim in mind, i.e. efficiency, speed, agility, and competitiveness. Those are the, the things that we focus on. Okay, great. Guys, so let's pause here a second and run our second poll question. Uh, Tracy, if you can help us. So again, for our participants, it's uh, on the right-hand side, there's a tab with polls. And the second polling question will uh, pop up here real soon. This time it's about uh, COVID impact. It'll be open in just one second. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. We can see it now. So here the question is about you know the the pandemic. Um, how how did it impact your digitization plans? Did it accelerate them? Did it slow you down? Or are you keeping the same pace? So please take a minute, uh, submit your, your input, and we'll talk about it. And while we're um, working on this question, the next uh, portion in, in this panel would be actually open uh, Q&A session with you all. 
So the panelists are here to, to answer your questions. Again, on the right-hand side, below the polling tab, there's a Q&A tab. Uh, feel free to submit your questions. They'll come straight to us, and I'll address them to the team. Okay. So, Tracy, thank you. Looks like um, the poll has ended. So here we see somewhat of, of an even split. Uh, about 40% actually had their plans slow down. Uh, over 30% had their plans actually accelerated, and about a quarter maintained uh, their rate. So it looks like uh, we're all over the place here. Um, guys, as we're getting questions from the audience, anyone would like to comment on this? Yeah, I mean, I can comment on this. Um, uh, I mean, I think Kurt and I are in similar scenarios where we're heavily dependent on commercial aviation, and so it's had a tremendous impact on our business. So, um, so in regards, I'm not sure it necessarily decelerated our efforts in Industry 4.0, but um, some of the efforts got refocused uh, because we've had to ramp down production and then, uh, you know, and deal with the issues at different sites and then looking at how to ramp production back up as things start to improve. So I think it just changed the focus a little bit in regards to the Industry 4.0 activities that we've had ongoing. Yeah, and that, that's a good point, Bob. I think we're we're very similar, as you mentioned. Um, in some cases, the the slowdown has allowed us to focus on some things like infrastructure upgrades that normally might have been kind of disruptive to production. Um, so we've been able to carry those out. In other cases, where we wanted to implement into production and start tracking data, we haven't been able to do those things yet. So we're we're kind of at at both ends of that issue. Okay. And, and I think everybody's been impacted to some extent. You know, our supply chain was significantly impacted. Uh, some of our suppliers, especially overseas, either shut down or we couldn't go over there. They couldn't come over here. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we're all working virtually instead of face-to-face. -face. And even though virtually has been pretty good in general, sometimes when you're working very complex problems, it's very difficult to work, you know, on a, on online. And then, Finally, you know, a lot of our initiatives like uh, the IoT connecting equipment and everything is, is very heavily facilities. And very honestly, facilities have been preoccupied by a whole lot of other things since the COVID <laughs> crisis has occurred. I, I, I have examples, I have examples for, for both ends of the poll. Um, on the one hand, once the COVID broke out um, as a small supplier down the supply chain of the of the big players, we stopped anything that doesn't generate money because we have to embrace ourselves. Where you know, when 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 Boeing sneezes, the supply chain takes a heart attack. <laughs> and on the other hand, because of the COVID-19, we 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 received a brand new autoclave, and we had to install it completely by ourselves. Uh, without no help from the autoclave manufacturer, um, we had to do everything remotely. So the, they uh, we put all the techno, all the uh, you know all the uh, video conference calls that we needed, uh, and they helped us install an autoclave with no technicians from the OEM. Uh, it was the first time also for the autoclave OEM, and we actually did it faster then they would have done it if they would have sent technicians uh, to Israel to install the autoclave. Even the autoclave manufacturer, they were shocked how quickly and how, he, and how easy that went. Okay, that, that's amazing. So, thanks, guys. So let, let's start with some questions here from the audience. Uh, I'll just say this, there, there are a lot of them. So I'll do my best to pick a, a few, uh, and then the rest perhaps we can take offline. Um, there was a, one question was about overscoping. Uh, a few of you warned about that, uh, not to overscope. So, what does it mean to overscope, and and how do you know that you've done that? Uh, Kurt, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, to me, to me, overscoping uh, is first of all trying to bite off more than you can chew to get started. So um, it, if if you don't have any connected systems in your factory today, jumping into a fully prescriptive AI solution for your whole factory might not be the place to to <laughs> try to insert into this technology. Um, so that that would be one example. Um, another would be, uh, to me, uh, setting the, a reasonable expectation for the benefit you're trying to, to get. Um, so having um, digital trending of the NDI data that I mentioned um, isn't going to make your quality problems all go away. Um, like someone said earlier, I think it's going to help you get to the answer sooner, but it doesn't eliminate the problem. Um, and so you have to have reasonable understanding and expectations about what the benefit uh, of the technology you're trying to introduce will really uh, bring to the table. Okay. Um, uh, Bob, please. Yeah, so one of the things that we implemented to try to address the, the risk of overscoping is um, using an agile framework, which is really pioneered in the software industry, but it's really about looking at incremental progress uh, and so forth, rather than looking at some major goal that you're trying to achieve. Um, that, that allows you the ability to adjust uh, as you move along and, and better able to meet your goals because they're small, they're small goals that lead up to a, you know, a major benefit to the organization. Okay, Jaha? Yeah, well, Bob already said most of what I wanted to add, but uh, um, it, it's important to set realistic goals that are, you know, like every other project. Uh, don't set a goal that is too far away. Uh, otherwise, even if it's not over scope, scope, it will be because it will be people will think it's so far away and they will lose hope in the in the way there. Okay. So allow me here to share some of our experience, you know, specifically to the uh, digitization projects. Um, I believe Kurt also referenced that, you know, try to assess where you are. If you're still heavily analog, heavily paper intensive, then don't go running all for, you know, super duper AI. Uh, start with uh, digitization. And once you've established that, start going into, uh, you know, uh, predictions, analytics, uh, all the way up to the more advanced uh, capabilities that are out there today. Uh, this has been our advice all along, and that is also consistent with the, uh, you know, with the agile approach uh, Bob and Shaha referenced. Uh, you know, it's a journey. It's not a flip the switch, get it done. Um, so, so Don, allow me to take you actually to the next question. It's about uh, data security, ITAR compliance, NIST, and so forth. It's a big deal. Um, and certainly yourselves from the defense industry, where do you even start? Excuse me, Don, you're on mute. Yep. Sorry, I try to <laughs> knock down my dogs barking back here. Uh, well, first of all, I think as you realize, Lockheed Martin is probably one of the most hacked companies in the world. You know, we it's one of those things where cybersecurity, industrial security is incredibly important for us. Uh, and we try to, you know, separate our systems where we can. We try to make sure that so we, we're very active in the cybersecurity world, not only for our, obviously our products, but our development activities. But that's always a big concern, of course. Uh, uh, NIST wise, and you know, we're 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 in the mode of trying to understand, you know, what should engineering look like? What should manufacturing look like? What do work instructions look like? You know, what is what is really model-based engineering and how do you deliver that to the floor so there, there's a whole lot of things we're working on right now to try to find the right mix of and balance for what that engineering around look like and of course trying to be compliant with all the regulations and the customers and the customers really have a lot of of interesting demands these days and interesting perspectives on data and and so there's there's a lot of things and of course itar is really big you think about the f-35 we do it all over the world, you know, Israel, Italy, uh, uh, Turkey, everywhere. And, and, and those are some things that, you know, that we have to build into our tools, you know, whether it's a Siemens tool or a Dassault tool, all of that has to kind of work together. So a lot of things for 
our IT people to, to worry about with all of our new systems. But again, I would say that's that's business as usual for us. It's just as you try to get more connected, you've got to be more careful because the more you're connected, the more vulnerable you can be sometimes. So it's really a double-edged sword on that. Okay, fair enough. Bob, would you like to comment on that as well? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so a couple of things. One thing that we've done is that our manufacturing uh, assets, so all of the data that we're collecting off our manufacturing, that is not connected to anything to the outside. So, so there's no pathway for somebody from the outside to be able to hack into our equipment. Um, and so, so that's one way we're addressing um, cybersecurity. And then, you know, we're just, um, um, you know, in our case, it's there's proprietary data there that we need to track for our customers. And so, you know, if if we have um, if if we need service on a piece of equipment, right, they have to come on site to work it. We do not allow them to be able to uh, access the equipment remotely. Uh, you know, the co a comment from our CIO is that. A little bit of inconvenience is okay, right, to keep you safe. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So let, let's move on to the next question. By the way, uh, guys in the audience, there are a lot of questions, great questions. Uh, we'll just do our best to run through a couple more, and and then we'll, we'll find a way to respond uh, offline. So, Tracy, I hope you're recording all of this. Um, Kurt, would you like to comment a bit about AI, the big word? and um, how you put it, um, you know, how do you bring it on board? How do you use it? Where do you use it? Sure, yeah. Um, so AI, as, as you know, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, to me, if you're familiar with all the different types and categorizations of analytics, to me it's, it, it kind of falls in that prescriptive analytics. So you've taken the data, you've assessed the situation, you have some automated means of, of saying this is what you ought to do or should do. Sometimes it can do that automatically or autonomously. Uh, sometimes it requires uh, input or oversight. Um, we we have a few instances of, of systems we've put into place I would consider AI. Um, one in particular that comes to mind has to do with a, a painting system and so we are or certain structures actually reverse engineering the structure on the fly because we don't know exactly what that structure uh, looks like. It's not in its nominal form when we see it for painting. And so we have algorithms that work together to actually read in, reverse engineer what that structure is, and then tell the automated paint equipment what to do with that structure once it makes it into the paint booth. Um, so that, that's probably our, our, our best introduction of, of true AI at this point. Um, and even that's, that's probably, uh, a little bit on the, on the, in the gray area of what AI really is. So, um, I, I would say we're dipping our toe in the water right now. We're not fully immersed yet. Okay. Thanks, Gert. Fair enough. Uh, Bob, Shahar, would you like to comment? Looks like we lost Don here for a couple of minutes. I can, yeah, I mean, I can um, comment. So I, I would say, you know, from uh, AI and machine learning and so forth, uh, we're probably not even dipping our toe yet. Um, as Kurt mentioned, um, you know, we're we're doing a lot of analytics, we're collecting the data, and then we're using human intelligence to to make some sense of that data uh, using analytics tools. Um, you know, eventually we'll probably get to AI and machine learning and so forth. But right now it's it's really about digitalization and analytics to uh, gain insight and make decisions. Okay. Thanks, Jaho. As, as I said earlier on, we've had our first ex first experience with AI with the Bluetooth system, and since everybody was very happy with the results, uh, we, we're waiting for the next miracle of AI. Um, but uh, you always the, the most important thing about AI is uh, you have to you always have to remember that if you put junk into the AI system, it will generate junk. Good point. Yeah, That's the most important thing about AI. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you know, also from our perspective, it's um, 
you know, it's first about defining the problem and then about introducing uh, uh, increased levels of intelligence into the analytics. Sure, data collection is, is important and you put a nice dashboard, but eventually people need to be looking at the dashboard and then the people make the decisions. That's, uh, I guess, Bob's comment on the human intelligence. So how can we elevate that to allow AI, machine learning, and otherwise to make predictions? And then the ultimate level is the prescriptive, the optimization. So by all means, uh, this is a gradual process. I think we talked about this before. Adana, I'm glad you can jump back in. Uh, the question was about uh, AI, uh, a big oh. word, but if you could just give us a minute about what this means for Lockheed. Well, I, I, th I think obviously not only for our products, but for the, our data, uh, we do these what we call robotic process automations where we're trying to automate a lot of the processes that have been manual in the factory. We're, we apply automated, you know, uh, AI to, you know, factory performance data, trying to be develop, you know, predictive, uh, predictive information instead of just descriptive information. You know, what is what is this disruption going to do to us? Hey, we have this supplier problem or this quality problem. And so we're looking at, you know, how do you modify the the build of the airplane for things that happen in the factory? So there's a there's an enormous number of applications, and and frankly, one of the things we're doing is trying to to grow our own. Uh, I'm going to call it citizen data scientists. Now you still need the data engineers and the and the and the guys with the in the ivory towers to help you, but but you know people who work this technology got to understand the processes. You can't just put a you know, somebody who's a computer guy and say, hey, fix this problem, because you got to understand the problems to be able to fix it, you know, and, and, but the number of applications is, I think we're just scratching the surface uh, for what we do. Okay, fantastic. So guys, we're about to wrap up uh, towards the uh, kind of the end of our panel. Uh, let's put together, if, if each of you could put together a few closing comments, take a minute or two. Uh, about the different topics we covered today. Um, Chaha, would you like to go first? Yeah, well, the, the, the most important things uh, we learned from uh, digital, the, the 4.0 and the digital digitalization um, is that you have to make sure you you know uh, you know your targets and and you make sure that you put the right information into the system. Um, as I think Kurt said that uh, if you have the wrong sets of data, you can make wrong decisions. Um, uh, you have to be very careful though and make sure that everybody is engaged uh, into this uh, move. Uh, you'll always have the ones uh, that are against everything new, and uh, you have to make sure they're not poisoning the rest of the team. Okay, Jachal, thank you. Bob? Yeah, I mean, I think it, 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 in the end, every organization needs to continually improve. That's been the case uh, as long as companies have uh, have been around. Uh, digitalization is one way that companies can improve their operational efficiency, improve their quality, um, you know, be able to deliver their products um, faster and, um, you know, meet all of the schedule and, and performance requirements. And so, um, so we just really look at it as digitalization and Industry 4.0 is part of continually improving the overall operations of our company. And, and, and making that incremental improvement really empowers everybody that's involved with it because they see that their idea got implemented, it improved their operations, and it improved the bottom line for the company and, uh, and so forth. So I think it's important to create that culture within a company of continual improvement and showcasing how digital tools can help them do that. Okay, thanks, Bob. Don, would you like to comment? <sighs> Yes, uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, the digital thread, digital twins have forever changed the way manufacturing is going to do business. I mean, the connection between engineering and manufacturing, the automation, the uh, all of the 
it's, it's just amazing. In fact, every time I turn around, there's some new technology. So I think the digital thread, that part of digitization is, is change manufacturing forever. However, I believe that really Industry 4.0 the, the, the industrial revolution of data is going to change the world. I mean, literally what we do every day, how we do what we do, how we get our data, how we find out things. I know one of my one of my bosses, uh, you know, he wants to he wants to pick up his phone and find the answer on his phone. He wants to know how we're doing, how we're performing. And he wants all the data at his fingertips on the phone. And you think about that for a minute and you realize that is really possible. You know, I can I can I can monitor the fleet of aircraft out there on F-35, you know, from a phone. I can understand how I'm performing in the factory. I can understand where my shortages are, where my suppliers are. And you imagine that level of integration and think about what that's going to do to what to people that work for us, how they're going to work, how they're going to. It's just uh, kind of an incredible thing when you think about it, but it, it is going to literally change the world. Thanks, John. And Kurt, how about yourselves? Yeah. Um, so I, I saw a couple of comments in the in the or a couple of questions in the list um, that I, th I think would help sum it up. One is kind of how do you get started in this? How do you start engaging with suppliers and partners that can help you introduce this kind of thing? Um, and there's lots of different ways to do that. Obviously, webinars like this are a good place to to get started. Um, there are trade associations and different consortia out there, like SESME, which is a Manufacturing USA Institute. Um, so those sorts of resources are out there, and that's where I would suggest going to get started and, and get educated to begin with. Um, in addition to that, I would say start small. Just start on something and work through understanding, are you working on a proof of concept? Are you playing in a sandbox? Or are you looking to do a pilot production application? And understand what the impacts of, of those various scenarios look like. If you're going to a pilot production, be aware of infrastructure needs to scale up and how does it fit into your overall strategy for replicating and deploying more of those kinds of things. So have those things in mind, um, but get started with something, start small, and build on your success. Super, Kurt, thank you. And allow me to also add a new concept that we are really pushing hard. A proof of concept is more of a technical question. Uh, we always talk about a proof of value. So the thing works, but what does it do for you? How does it help your organization, your business goals, et cetera? So thanks, guys. Uh, we're really at the top of the hour here. So thanks for participating in this panel. Kurt, Bob, Don, and Shahal, thanks a lot. Uh, Tracy, back to you for wrapping up. All right. Wow, that was so awesome. Thank you. What a great discussion. Super informative. So, like Abner said, thank you so much to all of our panelists, Don, Bob, Kurt, Sashar, and, of course, our moderator, Abner. We appreciate all setting aside this time to have this discussion with us and for us. Um, and, of course, we want to thank all of the attendees who participated in this webinar as well. So, please make sure that you join us for our next webinar in August. Registration is now open for the panel discussion on challenges and rewards pushing the envelope on um, large bonded structures, moderated by Doug Decker on August 20th. So we hope to see you there. Thanks everyone.